Today's interview is brought to you by Algorand. You'll be hearing more about them as well as Decipher 2022, their event in Dubai, later on in the show. But for now, let's get on with today's interview. I'm extremely happy to welcome back Lynn Alden of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Lynn, great to have you here. Thanks for having me back. It's my pleasure, Lynn. Exactly one year ago, October 20th, 2021, we filmed the first Forward Guidance ever, and I was really thrilled to have you be our first guest. So uh, I was very proud of that interview, and I want to do sort of a retrospective now that it's a, a year later. In that, in that interview, you foresaw that inflation would continue to be hot and actually get a lot hotter, and that that would put a lot of pressure on financial markets. What over the past year has surprised you and what uh, is, is sort of been in line with, with your thesis? What have, you, what have you made of the past year, Lynn? Well, so I, I would say the inflation has been uh, as expected, if anything, hot, um, uh, you know, pretty hot. And I've been surprised, obviously, by the escalation in, in Europe. You know, when we were talking a, a year ago, um, I, I would not have guessed that, you know, on, on my 2022 bingo sheet, uh, I did. I did not imagine the level of of conflict and war we have, uh, you know, on Russia going after Ukraine like that. Um, I would not have guessed for energy prices in in Europe to skyrocket as much as they did. I would not have guessed sabotage on Nord Stream. So we certainly added some drama to this whole thing. Um, and it's funny. I've been a bond bear, right? So I've, I remember like last year I would go on multiple interviews and explain why I don't like bonds. Uh, uh, primarily my focus was on real terms. I was like, I'm not even sure what yields are going to do, but uh, especially on inflation adjusted sense, I don't like bonds. Um, and they've done even worse than I would have guessed. Um, so they, they've hit higher nominal yields, much lower, m- much worse price sell-offs than I would have guessed a year ago. So even I, I actually, despite being a bond bear, I've not been bearish enough on bonds. And so I, I would say the extreme of some of the moves. So the the surge in the dollar, the surge in the yields, the war in Europe, uh, you know, um, some of these kind of ex- the extreme levels of the moves, I, I think would say has surprised me to some degree. Mm. Lynn, you say you weren't bearish enough on bonds. No one was bearish enough on bonds. The route from the sovereign bond market has been truly historic on a nominal total return basis, actually worse than the 1970s so far for, for, for a year year's basis. Uh, so we, we've got a chart here, and the more extreme decline in purple is the global Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index. Orange is U.S. bonds, and again, the dollar's been strong, so it's uh, the pain has been not as acute there. Uh, why do you think yields have sold off so much? You know, you had an inflationary thesis a year ago. Okay, bonds, they're not going to be a great investment. That was right, but it's been even more than that. They've they've really been at the the eye of the hurricane, and and normally during times when the economy is slowing, bonds do do okay. Why do you think bonds are, are doing so badly? What what would you, what so you the, say? So the short answer is inflation. Um, and I you know I started writing about bonds back in 2019. Uh, in, in some cases a little bit earlier, and I, I had an article in the middle of that year, basically saying, "Are we in a bond bubble?" And I went through the whole thing where you know we had you know 18 trillion dollars in negative yielding. Uh, debt out there. Uh, magazine covers were saying inflation's dead. Um, and I kind of reviewed this whole possible thing. I was like, inflation is something that in extreme environments, fiscal and monetary authorities, especially when working together, can generate you know, uh, quite well if, if they get to the point where they need to. And you know, we got the catalyst the next year in 2020. And ever since then, we've been off to the races in terms of the amount of monetary expansion, um, uh, you know, at the, at the broad layer, not just base money, but broad money expansion, more money in people's pockets. Then combined with very, various inflationary forces like energy crisis and kind of a, a reversal of some of these um, offshore and globalization trends, which keeps downward pressure on, on labor prices domestically. And so when bonds are yielding next to nothing and inflation is reaching uh, four decade highs, I think it's natural for those yields to want to push up. Uh, because they're, you know, even even at these, you have this, even after this crazy sell-off, those yields are still below at least current inflation. Now they're above forward inflation expectations, but forward inflation expectations has not been particularly accurate uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and so, I think it's a combination of one, trying to deal with the inflation, and two, some of it's mechanical. Some of it is, you know, as central banks are trying to fight that inflation, they're trying to not buy as many bonds or even let some bonds mature off their balance sheet. And so you now you have basically oversupply of bonds, large deficits, 
And then you have some of the biggest buyers not selling and then, I mean, not buying. And then when you go to some markets, like for example, the U.S. Treasury market, uh, you know, f uh, foreign countries use those treasuries as like a ballast for their own currencies. So when the dollar is weak, they're generally accumulating treasuries. Uh, and when the dollar is like, very, very strong, like it is now, especially compared to you know many other developed market currencies. So, so ironically, some of the emerging markets are actually holding up better, but the dollar is very strong relative to a lot of these uh, other currencies. And so what they do is, you know, first they stop buying treasuries. And then two, they can start letting treasuries mature off their, their balance sheet. They can sell some of the shorter duration stuff that they have. And, you know, if it gets bad enough, they could even sell some of the long duration treasuries. And so you have a lack of a foreign bid for treasuries. Uh, and so basically in this environment, it's just it's a very toxic combination for the sovereign bond market. I would say that, yeah, again, going back to 2019, I was saying that, you know, whatever excess there is in equities, I was more concerned about the bubble that's in sovereign bonds, because when you have, you know, for the first time ever, like negative yields or in the United States, like record low yields. And uh, I was uh, at long horizon. I was seeing inflationary pressures, uh, you know, possible to start building. It's just a toxic combination. And it's 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 funny. It surprised even me with how rapidly uh, it happened. And part of that is because we got certain catalysts that they were even more rapid than we could have gotten. Like, again, the energy energy crisis in Europe and the war in Europe. Later on, I want to get your current view on bonds, your outlook, how's that's changed. But I just want to hone in on a point you made, which is that the bond market was wrong. If you had looked at real yields, that is taking into account what nominal yields are, as well as inflation expectations, the bond market was forecasting, pricing in very low levels of inflation in 2020. And the bond market has been absolutely wrong. So, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a kind of a chestnut in the investment business that you got to look at the bond market. Oh, the bond market's telling you this. Lynn, come on, the bond market's telling you that. How would you evaluate the bond market's track record over the past, let's say, three years for forecasting growth and inflation? I would say, I mean, it's like an F. It's failed. I mean, the bond markets, I mean, equities, if anything, have been, been more accurate than bonds in the past few years. Um, and I think it's that that's kind of common at major trend shifts, right? So... Uh, you know, you had 40 years of kind of structural disinflation, and yet you had periods of inflation in there, like the, like the 2000s decade, but you still had a structural disinflationary trend. So we had structurally falling interest rates, higher and higher debt relative to GDP, globalization. Uh, you know, a lot of these were these, you know, uh, uh, disinflationary forces, aging demographics, for example, uh, in some cases can be disinflationary. There's actually some nuance there that I would, uh, they actually can be disinfl uh, inflationary in some, in some cases, but we had these, a, a 40 year period of kind of like the, 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 the great normalization, the great disinflation. And, you know, kind of my contention is, uh, when we run into the next issue back then, so I was saying 2019, when we run into the next problem. You know, there's not a lot of, of wiggle room here, and so we're probably going to get some some more inflationary types of fiscal policies. And then also, when you look at the at the kind of the long term commodity cycle, right? So there's periods of 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 overinvestment, there's periods of underinvestment. Uh, some of these longer term projects take many years to come online, so there's kind of a natural rhythm to commodity markets. And what I would generally see when I looked out uh, on research, is I, I would see two. I would see very siloed research. So I see, you know, the people making disinflationary calls. They're not talking about energy capex at all, right? The, it's just completely off their radar in many cases. And then you go in other areas and and say they're not very familiar with bond market dynamics or, or things like that. And so when you kind of put some of those pieces together, it just wasn't a very attractive situation for bonds. And then furthermore, even going back say 40 years. The type of inflation we had this time is quite different than the 1970s inflation. So a lot of people that were kind of, when they were determining whether or not inflation is going to happen, they were looking at the 1970s and saying, well, we don't have those conditions. So why would we get inflation? And it's like, well, go back to the 40s and you'll see why 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 we were going to get inflation. And so that was, in my view, the 1940s were the closest analog. And the big difference there is that, the, you know, in the 1970s, inflation was in large part coming from uh, you know, uh, peak demographics. So baby boomers entering the workforce, buying tons of homes, uh, a lot of uh, banks lending, and therefore a lot of money supply growth from banks lending. And a lot of people said, none of that's happening, so we can't get inflation. And it's like, well, the other level of inflation is like the 1940 style inflation, where you have absolutely massive government deficits that are monetized and supported by the central bank. It, it pours money into the economy, goes around the banking system, 
or in, in Russell Napier's view, it, it supports the banking system, but you can also just go around them pretty much. Uh, and it just you know puts more money in people's pockets. Uh, and then you add, it's, it's basically wartime finance. And so in 2020 and 2021, mm-hmm. we had wartime finance in response to lockdowns and things like that. It, you know, basically, if you, if you just showed me charts what was happening, it looks like a war. Um, and, and of course, now we have actual war, which is also inflationary because it's 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 malinvestment. It it it, it reduces it adds frictions. It reduces um, productivity. It reduces uh, global efficiency. And so this is a, this is a very inflationary cocktail. And in the 1940s. There was yield curve control, so yields wouldn't spike higher. What happened in 1946? If, let's say, we're coming out of this sort of wartime thing where, where we're monetizing the debt because the, the Fed is not buying treasuries now. They're, they're reducing their holdings. They're doing quantitative tightening, QT, instead of quantitative easing, QE. What happened in 1946, and, and is it a good analog for 2022 and 2023? Well, so there were, there were a variety of periods throughout that time. So they, they actually didn't fully let go of that financial oppression, really, until the early 1950s. Uh, and it was actually that mm. that's when it became a political struggle because you had the Fed wanted to be get independent again. So during the war, essentially the Fed lost independence more or less. And they wanted to reassert that independence. And you know, the Treasury's like, well, not yet, not yet, not yet. And so you had this environment where they were still running this kind of inflationary playbook and they were still capping, they were still holding yields lower than the prevailing inflation rate. Mm-hmm. And eventually you had a separation. Uh, but that that took several years to manifest, and you know there there were kind of the year by year playbooks what was happening each year. But essentially, you know, I, I when it comes to analogs, I try not to match things up year by year, right? It's more about the, the mm-hmm. broad paintbrush, right? So obviously, technology is very different than the '40s. Uh, the type of you know the the reason for the financing is different than the '40s. The political environment is different than the '40s. Uh, I, I've I've often said that the U.S. today looks more like the U.K. of the 1940s, which is you know the incumbent power. <laughs> Uh, and the structural trade deficit power, whereas back in the 40s, the United States had a structural trade surplus. Um, and so mm-hmm. there are things that are different than that environment. But the short version is, is it's kind of like a hotel in California where it's very, very hard to get out uh, once you get into the situation. And one of the – basically the reason they were able to get out back then is because they didn't have that demographic problem. They didn't have that top heavy uh, uh, basically entitlement program. And so after the war was over – they were able to start getting a handle on the budget. Uh, they were able to start, you know, th- uh, federal debt never went down nominally in any significant degree, but they basically managed to hold it flat for a number of years as nominal GDP, partially from real growth and partially from inflation, caught up to it essentially. So you you lower the debt to GDP that way, uh, and the problem now is that we're still running, tri- you know, in the United States, trillion dollar deficits. Uh, with with no end in sight because it's it's you know in addition to these kind of one time programs we also have this this background overlay of trillion dollar deficits that are largely due to our structural budget issues and then that's you know you can look at Japan you can look at Europe uh, parts of Europe and it's kind of the same problem and now Europe has an acute energy crisis which is kind of like a wartime situation you have a national security issue if you can't produce things at, at reasonable prices compared to the rest of the world and if people can't afford their heating bills and can't afford to keep the power on and you have some degree of demand destruction from from companies shutting down so in, in many cases this continues to resemble the 1940s and i think i think we're probably still in the early 1940s if anything i think we're still you know the war is not over yet right so this is not like 1945 1946 this is like you know wave one i think of this of this dilemma i think the war ends when the energy supply situation is more resolved and some of these geopolitical things are more resolved. And then probably also when you've inflated quite a bit of the debt away, which is, I think we're nowhere near doing. So you know a lot more about the 1940s than, than, than I do, but it seems that a hallmark of that period, as you said, is yield curve control. The Federal Reserve would not allow bond yields to rise to levels that they would naturally go because it's inflation, so no one wants to own bonds. And as such, the federal government can get a very cheap way of financing debt. It seems that to me, from March 2020 to March 2022, that framework uh, held pretty much perfectly intact. And I get it's still intact in terms of the budget deficits and in terms of the, the war. But it seems that f- you know from the beginning of this year until now, 
the Federal Reserve has not played ball. And they've uh, not only have they not monetized the deficit, they're reducing their holdings via quantitative tightening, as well as they've they're raising rates uh, not only above zero, but they're raising it so fast and so uh, in such an extreme manner that it's causing a global dollar uh, shortage. There's been so much pressure in, in sovereign bond markets. We saw what's happening in the UK. We, we saw what's happening in Japan. Uh, effective, real, 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 real control in Japan. Um, in the UK, Bank of England had to restore order, inject liquidity. They're not calling it quantitative easing. Uh, where do you think this ends? Uh, because I feel like for the 1940s analogy to, to, to remain intact in, in full, it would require central banks to come back and you know put put a lot more punch back in the punch bowl, whereas now they seem pretty intent on on draining uh, and it's, it's causing a, a monetary crisis. Yeah, that's a good point. For the first you know, couple of years here, that we've been kind of running the 1940s playbook pretty closely. Now, uh, you know, kind of Powell doesn't want to be the fall guy for this, right? So now he's trying to run the 1970s playbook. Uh, the problem is that when Volcker did that playbook. You know, the United States has 30% federal debt to GDP uh, and lower private debt to GDP. And, you know, by the time you got to the end of the 1970s, you resolved a lot of the underlying energy supply shortages, right? So it wasn't just, mon- you know, yeah, Volcker gets all the credit, uh, but it was also the those underlying forces were, were more resolved, right? And so the problem now is that, you know, it, basically, is there any relief structurally on the energy supply side? Over the next few years, and I, I would say no. There's not a ramp up in capex. You know, there's there's short term band aids. So, for example, you know, the, the current administration is drawing down the strategic petroleum reserve to add excess supply. Uh, China has been doing rolling lockdowns for you know two three years now, uh, and so you, they've they've been below total flight normal flight capacity, driving capacity. So they're reducing their fuel usage. So we have these kind of like forces that are kind of you know, kind of keeping the, the lid on energy to some extent, at least outside of Europe. Um, and the problem is that a lot of those are kind of temporary and and, and, they're, and it's only resolvable by actual new supply coming online. And that's not really happening. And then ironically, by raising rates, you suppress demand to some degree, but you also increase the cost of capital for those energy companies. And so the hurdle rate for their investment, especially in longer term projects, is now higher. Um, and so I think, I, I think that the kind of the end game here, so we already see Japan's running the 1940s playbook, right? They're they're full full capping yields. It's actually even lower yield cap than the 1940s because that was 2.5 percent. This is you know a uh, uh, 0.25 uh, which I think is too low, but that's the level they chose. So they're running a super. They're running a 1940s playbook. The ECB is doing spread control, uh, you know, where they're trying to support Southern European mm-hmm. uh, debt from blowing out. So they have there's some degree of yield curve management happening there. And then we you know with the Bank of England, again, they're not doing formal yield curve control, but they jumped in when it when the when the market actually broke. And so I, I think the Fed's kind of in a similar boat where you know they can tighten un- unless or until the Treasury market breaks in the similar way that gilt market broke or something like that. So as long as the Treasury market remains intact. They can be somewhat independent. They can be. They can run the Volcker playbook. They can tighten. They can try to increase unemployment. They can. They can do the strong dollar playbook. So that, in addition to reducing some degree of, of of demand in the United States, it also reduces demand for things among frontier markets and and other parts of the world because they all get squeezed by the strong dollar. And then the question is how far they can push it. And I think that you know the question I've been asking is. What's step two, right? So step one is hold the beach ball underwater, suppress demand, hold this down, and then okay. So let's say you're successful. You've you've caused a recession. You've crushed frontier markets. Uh, you know everybody believes you're going to be a hawk. Now what, right? So when you let when you ever want to reaccelerate, you ever want to grow again, you let that beach ball go, and then energy supply problems still here. That's you know that's not it hasn't been solved, and so the beach ball pops back up again. So much like in the 70s, you had rolling inflation. In the 1940s, you also had, you know, had spikes in inflation. Then you had even had periods of, of deflation because partially you had price and wage controls. Partially there's this, there's you know there's there's underlying just just volatile changes that are happening during that decade. It's not just a straight line up of inflation. And so I think the 2020s are going to be similar, um, which is you know no playbook follows the exact playbook, but essentially we are in the the the, the empire strikes back phase now. Where they're they're trying to gain some control of this, but my my kind of focus is what is step two? What is how do you fix the energy supply side? Because I think until that's solved, inflation is going to be ready to come around. And so until then, you're choosing between you know kind of recessionary like conditions, either outright recession or might as well be a recession, 
or you're picking high inflation. And I think eventually, treasury market breaks, they have to get back to higher inflation, but that can take time because the treasury market is more resilient than a number of other sovereign bond markets. The final question you said about is, is a problem the Federal Reserve and all central banks have is that they essentially have no control over the energy situation. And if WTI oil goes you know, back from $80 back to 120 or God forbid, 150, it doesn't matter if the Fed fund rate is at 10%. It, it, it has very, very little effect, effectively no effect on, on energy prices whatsoever. So my, my question is, what will cause the Fed to pivot, if not in rates, then in, in QE or some other liquidity mechanism, perhaps they'll call it a facility. The suggestion of, oh, people can't raise rates because there's too much debt, that suggests the government's going to go bankrupt. But that's going to take a very long time. Uh, what is going to break before then? You mentioned the treasury market. Um, you know, the, the strong dollar is causing eating away at corporate profitability. Uh, it's causing stress otherwhere in the, in the global world. What do you think it is that will cause the Fed to to stop? Because we've already seen the Bank of England, they're dipping their toe back into uh, going away from, from full fighting inflation mode. Bank of Japan, we see that as well. What do you think is going to cause Jay Powell to do that? So I would say that probability favors the uh, treasury market. Um, and, you know, I think people people often fight the last war. So, you know, the, 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 the prior stimulus we got was like Oprah, you know, you get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. Uh, I, I think we're going to see more targeted interventions uh, because it, it's much harder to do the, the Oprah strategy when you have super high inflation. And it's more about, you know, if something breaks, you put the fire out while you're still being like, okay, we're still going to be tight, guys. We're still going to fight this, uh, but you're still putting a fire out. Kind of like how when the repo rate uh, spiked in 2019, it was kind of like, well, we got to put out this technical issue, but we're still, you know, uh, we're not in a recession, so we're not trying to go all out here. Um, and so, you know, right now, if you look at the treasury market, it's it's near record levels of illiquidity. It's near record levels of volatility. Um, and then the question is, how long can that persist, right? So if if the dollar takes a break, if rates take a break, for example, maybe the foreign sector stops trimming their holdings, maybe that can stabilize. On the other hand, if you keep pushing that really hard, uh, if you keep, you know, raising rates, if you keep uh, quantitative tightening, if you keep, uh, you know, strengthening the dollar, and then all those other countries keep trimming their holdings or not buying or letting letting bonds mature off their balance sheet, that kind of thing, that puts more and more pressure on the treasury market. Uh, and so there's a variety of tools they can do. One is the, you know, outside of the Fed, the Treasury Department can come in, and they can do, you know, they can they can do buybacks. They can buy off their run securities. They can issue more T bills. And so when you ask the question of like, you know, where is the balance sheet capacity to buy treasuries? One of the answers is reverse repo, right? But it only works for, for shorter duration stuff. And so there's a way to get liquidity out of there and into T-bills, but that that's effectively lowering the average duration of, of treasury debt if they do that. But that's an option that they have to extend this. Another option is that the Fed, you know, they have repo programs in place. Uh, they could They could do kind of their own sort of operation twist or their own sort of targeted uh, periods of time of, of QE if something breaks uh, while still keeping rates where they are. So, that, you know, they have a variety of tools to, you know, I, I think assist the treasury market if it does get to the point where they need to assist it. Uh, and you can kind of like be tightening on one hand and loosening on the other. Uh, and so that can still be like a net liquidity uh, add while you still have the optics of being tight. So I think that's I think that's probably the highest probability. You can also do things like SLR adjustments so that you have the banking mm -hmm. system buy more of the treasuries. And actually, if you go back to the 1940s, so right now the, tre the banking system in the United States has a, you know, a, a bigger percentage of their assets are treasuries than any time in modern history. If you go back far enough, though, the 1940s and, and, and shortly thereafter, they had even a higher allocation of treasuries. So you know during that whole war era, the Fed did a lot of the initial financing. You know, they increased their their Treasury holdings by like 10x between like 1942 and 1945. Uh, but then after that, a lot of it was bank financing. Um, and so, you know, there's there's tools to then put that on the banking side. That has that has political ramifications, right? There's some politicians that would not be thrilled with that. And so th there's there's a bunch of different levers that they can pull while while still you know retaining some degree of tightness or, or you know tight for certain things loose for other things essentially tight for the private sector but you can loosen a little bit for the for the public sector uh and so that's something that we've not really seen over the past decade uh but that you started to see for example bank of england was an example of that you know higher rates but then some degree of qe uh for the sovereign bond market and so i think i think you could see similar things like that now if they manage to avoid that 
then I think it, it, it goes in that longer term thing where you know U.S. government debt starts refinancing at higher and higher rates, and they're still running large deficits. So interest expense becomes an untenably large amount of the budget. And then that eventually, I think, breaks the treasury market and starts to require some sort of monetization or bank monetization, that kind of thing. There's also the fact that you know private uh, debt is rolling over. So even though we had this huge spike in mortgage rates, most people have locked in mortgages, right? So as long as you never mm-hmm. move, as long as the economy kind of holds still, you're safe. The problem is eventually someone's got to move. They might have to you know, get out of their mortgage, get into another mortgage. Some people have to come in, they have to buy a house. And so eventually some of that starts refinancing. Same thing with corporate bonds, right? So corporate bond yields spiked. Uh, but a lot of that, I mean, especially the, the higher quality companies, they have long duration uh, debt wherever possible. They use that opportunity to lower yields, uh, extend their debt as much as possible, the smart ones at least. And so it's not as though all all their debt has has gone up to this high level. It takes time. Quarter after quarter, more of that debt uh, comes due and they have to refinance it at these higher rates and that eats out of their uh, their profits. And that might make them want to streamline, might, might want, make them want to lay off some employees or slow down hiring. Uh, and so the existing tightening is already going to, you know, quarter after quarter take its toll on, on part of the private economy. So there, there are multiple paths that can that can eventually cause either recession or cause liquidity conditions in the treasury market. And at the current time, I think the treasury market is more acutely vulnerable, uh, but it's something I, I monitor on a week by week basis because this is, you know, it's a, it's a moving game. And to someone who owns, let's say, 20 year duration treasury bonds, with the 20 year going from 3.7% to 3.8% to 3.9%, to them, they're losing money every day. And that seems disorderly. Can you demarcate between a, an orderly decline and a true sort of panic that would uh, ca- cause the Federal Reserve to intervene? Yeah. So the the treasury market is not at panic yet. So an example of, of not even panic, just br- I would call it broken, right? So broken was March 2020. That was broken, which is basically you had this you know, basically global trade came to a halt, uh, cash flows of companies dried up, they still have dollar dominated debt, uh, there's a huge bid for dollars globally, you had a dollar spike, uh, and uh, a lot of countries sold treasuries to get dollars. Uh, and so you had a, you had basically off the run treasuries literally went like no bid, it just was like a broken market. Uh, and so that's an example of a market breaking. But the, of course, there's so much breaking back then, no one was really panicking about treasuries. They're like, well, the Fed's going to fix this. Um, so, but it was a broken market. And another example of a broken market is what happened to the gilt market, where you got yields uh, really spiking, and then you would have had a cascade of of pension liquidation, selling. You know, each one sells those those gilts, and then it, the next one has to sell because the price got even worse, right? So you have this 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 vicious feedback loop that that basically breaks everything. So, uh, you know, we're not there yet in the treasury market where it's it's ugly uh, uh, and it's it's disorderly. Uh, but it's not it's not outright broken. And I think part of it's because we, we got there at a much slower pace. So you can see on the screen there, yeah, the, the spikes that happened in March 2020, you know, it's, that was just a vertical straight line up. Whereas what we're seeing now has taken place over the past year and a half. And so it's been this slow grind towards worsening and worsening uh, volatility and, and, and worsening illiquidity in the treasury market. And it's just causing problems, but it's it's not something that the that, that, that they have to put out a fire like uh, you know this week. Yeah, and that, that chart on the right features the Move Index, uh, and I've actually interviewed the founder of the Move Index, Harley Bassman, so people uh, can check that out for for more details. We interrupt this program with breaking news. Algorand is hosting an event in Dubai from November 28th through November 30th, and I am going to be there. Decipher 2022 is a gathering of investors, developers, and founders featuring deep dives on blockchain's most important topics, interoperability, DeFi, sports, gaming, and the metaverse. It's an unparalleled learning opportunity. You need to be there. Think about it. You're going to be coming from Thanksgiving. Your family members are going to be wondering why you won't stop talking about the Federal Reserve. This is exactly what you need to stay in the most beautiful city in the world and meet and learn from leaders in the blockchain industry. By the way, if you are there, I will talk macro with you. So get a ticket today and come hang out with me in Dubai. Tickets are available now at decipherevent.com. And for a limited time, you can use code decipherfam22 for a discount on your pass. That's decipherevent.com. There is a live stream, so if you can't be there in Dubai, you can watch it remotely. However, there are certain things you'll only get to know if you're there in person, such as, will I remember to bring some black? If you ask me about how the reverse repo facility actually works, will I pretend to know the answer or will I be honest and say I have no clue? 
Decipher is hosted by Algorand, the world's most secure, scalable, and sustainable blockchain. Founded by Silvio Macaulay, the co-inventor of Zero Knowledge Proofs, Algorand recently partnered with FIFA to launch FIFA Plus Collect, the league's official NFT marketplace. With the World Cup going on in Qatar at this time, there are sure to be a ton of eyes and attention on that. So clearly there is a lot going on, not just for the Algorand ecosystem, but in the region more generally. So go to decipherevent.com. It's going to be a great event, and I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the interview. Lynn, so far, when you've talked about the Federal Reserve saving the bond market, that has been pretty uh, abstruse facilities such as a a treasury buyback program where they're issuing short-term bills for which there's a lot of demand to buy longer-term coupon notes for which there's very little demand. Uh, It's not quantitative easing and it's not even, you know, if you watch TV and people ask, oh, is the Fed going to pivot? Is the Fed going to pivot? They're talking about rates, the overnight rate, the Fed funds rate, and then the two-year treasury note, which which moves uh, based uh, largely on, on expectations of where that rate is going to be. Uh, right now, that sort of whole short-term interest rate complex is is pricing in a federal funds rate of up to 5% in, in literally 5.00% in spring of 2023. And, you know, is there going to be a Fed pivot? Eh, not really, says the bond market, because uh, interest rates are going to stay at that very high four, four, four digit level uh, for a long time. Do you agree with the bond market? Do you think it's possible that you know, if the Fed goes higher? Where are you sort of thinking about where rates go? So I, th- I think it's pretty clear that they're going over four. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion on exactly where they're going to get. I mean, if you asked me a year ago, I, I would not have guessed we're, we're this high by this point. So we're, we've already kind of um, gone up quicker than I would have guessed. Um, so I, I, I would be less prone to try to make a prediction there other than the point out that that there's nothing really stopping them from getting to that point, um, you know, in this environment. Because as long as they keep the treasury market functioning uh, through the other tools we just discussed, uh, you know, those other things can spike pretty high uh, until they manifest in an obvious recession, right? So, you know, it takes time for unemployment to happen. So the Fed's mandate is is basically, you know, they want low uh, long-term employment and they want price stability, which they define as 2% average inflation. And so looking at those metrics in the way that they measure them, of course, people can debate whether or not they're measuring them properly, but they they define how they measure them. And Powell has a clear mandate to p- push up unemployment and push down inflation. And, you know, that's not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen next month. It's going to take time. And, you know, there's, there's an argument that they've already – done enough and that they should, you know, they were already kind of on a recessionary path now and that maybe they should let some of the existing monetary policy take its toll. On the other hand, you have things like the Taylor rule or other sort of like, you know, metrics saying, you know, you should be at like high single digit rates. You should be above inflation, right? Uh, that That's kind of how they would do it historically. Of course, that doesn't take into account the fact that most debt isn't solvent at that point, including kind of the, the, the public sector, right? So um, I think we're in an environment where he, he can... The rates question, I think he's got you know some degree of flexibility with, as long as they they put out the fires. Because if you if you spike rates super high, it's likely to be good for the dollar, which is likely to continue in more forward selling of treasuries. So then the question becomes, if you're supporting the treasury market, if you're if you're doing one hand uh, and then tightening on the other hand, then that gives you more leeway to tighten with your with your one hand, right? And so. Um, I, I think that it, it, it's unclear how far they're going to get, but it does take time for some of these more obvious recession uh, indicators to manifest. So I wouldn't be surprised if they get you know, some pretty hawkish rate policies. And Lynn, what is your outlook on the economy? I know you are increasingly viewing that a recession is likely. I saw you uh, doing a lot of work on you know, inverted yield curves, uh, inflation-adjusted spending, PMIs. You know, is it pretty clear to you that the economy is slowing, and uh, yeah, I mean, how bad do you think things are going to get? So we've been in a, de- a declining PMI environment, so economic decelerating environment since since 2021, since you know the, towards the end of the year. And so, either way you look at it, we're in a declining, uh, a decelerating economy. And you know, we had we had two quarters of negative real growth, uh, third quarter is looking positive. Um, and, but I think the, the general trend is still negative, especially because the things I said before, like you know the, these existing high rates, let alone if they go higher, but the existing high rates, more and more debt's going to start refinancing those higher rates and put pressure 
on corporations uh, and and different types of consumers. Uh, you know, we're seeing kind of weakness in 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 auto lending uh, uh, kind of uh, default rates. Um, we're seeing uh, still, I think, I think PMIs are still kind of headed down longer term, and you know there are things that could change my mind. Like if, if you were to have some sort of big pivot and a weak dollar, that's a type of stimulus, right? So that that gives you some frontier market boom. That gives you you know kind of an uptick in cor- cor- corporate profitability. You can you can kind of arrest that decline and and you know maybe get a, another acceleration out of it. But it seems like if that's not the path they're going to go on, then I do think that the you know quarter by quarter, I think we're Unless there's a trend change, I think we are marching towards recession. Yes. And uh, how does that impact your views on asset allocation? You know, for, for 2020 and 2021, where we were in an accelerating growth environment, growth and inflation were rising. You wanted to, you know, a lot of a lot of investments, uh, energy, banks, and you definitely did not want to own bonds. But uh, is it finally time to own bonds if, if growth is decelerating? Well, growth has been decelerating, and yet it's not been a time to own bonds. That and that's what that's what that's Very what caught true. up a lot of the the bond <laughs> bulls and the disinflationary bulls. They were like, look, over the past X number of cycles, you know, when PMI decelerates, uh, bonds do well. And it's like, well, sure, unless you have kind of a record spread between bond yields and inflation, and inflation is still a problem because this is not this is not the last you know few decades of of playbooks. Uh, now. If if bonds blow out far enough, uh, you know, and they've already kind of exceeded what I would have guessed that they would have got to this quickly, you know, there's a point where they're they're interesting, uh, you know, especially the short end of the curve. Uh, if you want kind of risk mm-hmm. off uh, dry powder, and you say, well, I mean, the the yields are below inflation, but I'm concerned about recession. Uh, you know, those that that can I think be a reasonable place to park capital. Uh, I'm also, you know, I'm kind of um. Cost optimistic on gold uh, after, you know, it's held up better than the long end of the curve. Um, uh, and, you know, I think when there is kind of a liquidity uh, period, uh, I think, you know, gold can catch a bid while potentially, say, corporate profits are still struggling. And so you can get a bid in some of these harder assets that don't have margins, you know, kind of the gold Bitcoin mm-hmm. spread compared to something like corporations that even if there's a, a Fed pause or pivot, they might still have deteriorating corporate earning situations. So they, you know, stocks might run into issues, right? So there there are different kind of things to, to look out for like that. I, I generally think that as long as we're in this economic decelerating environment, uh, generally stay defensive. For me, that's it's been less about bonds and it's been more about things like healthcare stocks, uh, energy pipelines, tobacco uh, companies, you know, kind of consumer staple type of things. Um, and that's been, I've overweighted that. So I don't, I don't do like a fast turnover portfolio where I go all into the, just these things, but I've been I've been, you know, kind of tilting to that direction uh, since the beginning of this year, while still having a barbell approach of, of some uh, risk assets that I like. You know, some of them were worked out, some of them didn't. So, for example, Brazil has been one that I've been overweight. Brazil, that one's done quite well. Whereas, for example, I also have a Bitcoin allocation that is, you know, it's been holding up recently pretty well, but obviously earlier this year that's done quite poorly. And so I've been balancing kind of a, you know, kind of a risk off defensive higher yielding type of, of portfolio with some degree of inflation protection built in. Uh, and then, you know, kind of select risk assets. You know, I like, I like India. I like, I like Brazil, uh, long-term I like Bitcoin, but I have been, you know, I keep reminding people that generally in a declining PMI environment, it, it, it generally runs into headwinds. And how, t- cause I know, I know a lot of stuff that you, uh, like is outside of the U.S. So you mentioned India, Brazil. How does a rising dollar impact those uh, stocks? Because the simple way is okay. You bought it denominated in Brazilian real. Brazilian real is worth less against the dollar, so that's a dollar depreciation. Oh, also by the way, some of those companies might have dollar denominated debt. That's when they really start to get in trouble. However, for the same reason that Netflix, you know, is going to lose a billion dollars this year because the dollar is so strong. Uh, because they're they're being paid in foreign currency, which is worth less against the dollar. Uh, you know, if you're a Brazilian oil company, you're being paid in the dollar, which is now stronger. So, how do you think a, ri- a an extremely strong and perhaps rising dollar environment impacts those f- foreign assets, uh, non-U.S. stocks? Let's say that uh, uh, you tend to pay a lot of atten- attention to. So that's on a country by country basis. So, for example, the Brazil Brazilian real is actually holding up very well compared to the dollar this year. So the dollar is screaming higher. The dollar index is just going like a vertical line, but you wouldn't know it by looking yeah. at the uh, you know the Brazilian real compared to the dollar. Uh, and that's because you know they were super hawkish from the beginning. They actually they were hawkish quicker and stronger than the Fed. 
because uh, they had to be. And so they front ran the Fed. Uh, they raised from like, you know, 2% to like double digit interest rates. Uh, and they have that, that commodity uh, exposure. So that, that combination has been reasonably good for them. Uh, they also have dollar denominated debt, but then they have a decent amount of reserve. So they're not like, they're not as lopsided as a country like Turkey, where, where you have a lot more debt than you have reserves. Uh, Brazil's got some degree of balance there. So they're not one of the early dominoes to, to fall in that type of environment. Um, India has been a little bit more challenging, uh, but I think that, you know, the fact that they're, they're buying discounted Russian energy um, and, and they, I think they have a pretty pragmatic energy policy overall, again, because they have to, right? So when you, when you have a 2000 GDP per capita, uh, you know, they, they kind of have to, to be super pragmatic and, and kind of, you know, just get whatever's cheapest. Right. And, you know, they were even, they even asked, like they were, they were kind of asked, like, you know, are you going to be more selective of where you buy energy from? And I, I forget which minister it was, but they were like, uh, it was someone in India. It was like one of their finance ministers or energy ministers. And he's, he's like, look at Sri Lanka right on our doorstep. You know, we don't, we don't want to be Sri Lanka. Like that's, you get, you get rides in the street if you can't get energy and, and things like that at reasonable prices. And so India's kind of doing this very um, cautious approach. Uh, and so even though they're an energy importer, um, I think they're holding up reasonably well, uh, all things considered. Uh, and so I, I think that there are select foreign markets that are interesting having exposure to, especially if you do get to a point where treasury market runs into issues, Fed has to liquidate, liquefy it. And then even though they might not, they're not going to go to zero rates, they're still going to be kind of holding, uh, you know, macro happens in rate of change terms. And so if the dollar does mm -hmm. stop screaming higher, especially compared to on a currency by currency basis, not just compared to the euro or not just compared to the yen, but on a currency by currency basis, if that, rolls over, then that can give those those foreign assets some degree of a bid. So I think we're in an environment where you want to be defensive overall, but you still want to be on a lookout for interesting opportunities and not put things in one giant bucket. Like, you know, people say, okay, dollars up, so it must be terrible for emerging markets. It's like, well, not really for Brazil, uh, which is kind of, if anything, that's kind of the quintessential emerging market. Um, and so I think it's, it's a really kind of a case by case basis type of market. You're absolutely right. The U.S. dollar index, which people say the dollar is strong, most of the time they're talking about that. Over half of that is the euro, and then a, another huge component or large component is the yen. And those have been some of the two weakest currencies uh, actually this year because the ECB, European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan have been so reluctant to fight inflation. Do you see any? Because I know you, you know you, you look for investment opportunities around the globe. Do you see any opportunities in Europe and Japan? even though they kind of are at the center of the storm for like currency weakness? Well, there are companies there that have debt denominated in those currencies, but then they get foreign revenues, right? And also the many of them are cheap. So, you know, I've, I've not been very, I've not been very bearish on, for example, the Japanese uh, trading companies, right? Kind of these hard asset companies. Um, also a lot of, you know, in UK, for example, a lot of their top stocks are like, you know, commodity stocks and energy stocks, uh, Healthcare stocks that sell globally, for example, uh, and so you know if you if you find attractive companies in those jurisdictions that are not reliant on you're just only stuck in those regions, and that might even be short those currencies, you know, kind of indirectly through the debt markets, uh, that's not necessarily a bad place to look. And so I I do think that there are value opportunities uh, in in Japan and, and Europe, and you just have to be selective with with understanding what exactly that you're owning. Uh, but but broadly speaking, is a rising dollar sort of bad for those companies or or good? Because it, again, it's confusing because it's good for their revenues because their costs are they pay their costs in weak currency and they get revenues in strong currency. But then when you buy the asset, you're selling the dollar to to get something that's denominated in pound sterling, and, and that's you know not something that you typically want to do when when the sterling is so weak. So is it you know, which which effect is more powerful? You know. So again, it's on a company by company basis, right? So for example, with the dollar screaming higher, just about anything in the world denominated in dollars is struggling this year, right? So, you know, some healthcare companies and pipeline companies have, have positive returns, uh, but outside of some of those value factors um, or, or, you know, specific rate plays or shorts, you know, it's hard to get anything that's actually up in dollar terms. Most things, it's a matter of how, how down are you in dollar terms. And so, you know, some of those, for example, defensive Japanese value stocks are less down than the S&P 500 in dollar terms. Uh, some of those, um, you know, a, a, a UK energy company is up generally in dollar terms 
uh, whereas you know compared to the S&P S and P 500, which is down. Uh, and so it, it, it really depends on a case by case basis. What does what does that company do? Um, what was its valuation going into this? Right? Was it overvalued or was it already fairly or undervalued? And is it is it recession resistant? Is is its product going up in price? And so, uh, you know, in general, if you look at the the European and Japanese indices, they've done. You know, I haven't checked it in the past week, but if you look at them in dollar terms, like if you look at, um, you know, the 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 major developed market foreign uh, equity uh, things, and you, and you track them compared to the S P five hundred, they've been a little bit weaker in dollar terms, but it's not been a remarkable difference. It's been it's been kind of everything down uh, to to somewhat similar degrees. And then if you are uh, focus more on the value factor, more on the energy factor in these markets. They've generally held up better than than their markets, and held up better than say the Nasdaq or the S and P 500. So it, again, it comes down to generally what what is that company doing in that country? I want, want to dig into the energy factor. Uh, the energy sector in the S and P 500 is the only positive returning uh, sector this year, up something like 55 percent. Every other you know sector is down. Anywhere from like only five or ten percent for the safe stuff like utilities to you know thirty five percent for communication and maybe technology that's that sort of stuff, uh, and that has happened because the price of oil has has surged uh, to as high as you know over one hundred twenty dollars, uh, but then it fell sharply uh, going into the summer down to as low as I think seventy two dollars. Now we are uh, where roughly eighty six. So I know you've been. Uh, long and not wrong you know you people say long and wrong you've been long and not wrong on energy uh what do you see going forward because i know you see a lot of these structural deficits however we're going to recession and you know into a recession the price of oil tends to fall so what do you think so if you look at the at the global financial crisis uh, you know you had one of the worst recessions in modern history and oil demand globally even though so the price of oil got crushed right actual oil demand only fell very little Right. So so normal outside of the madness of like 2020, where we had the this completely historic event, uh, huge cliff in terms of oil demand. That was a, that was a sp- very specific uh, outcome. So putting that aside, even a severe recession only puts so much downward pressure on oil and gas uh, in terms of in terms of the quantity that is used. Um, now, the difference was in in the global financial crisis, you had a whole decade of more and more supply coming online uh, and you went from super cheap oil up to 140 dollar barrels of oil at one point and then you crashed down to some some crazy level and then actually after a session you, you quickly went back up to, to over 100 dollar barrels of oil um, in addition back then oil companies were kind of expensive relative to the underlying price of oil what makes this environment different is that oil companies are still not expensive relative to these prices. So there's a lot of pools of capital. They're not even allowed to invest in oil companies. Other ones kind of, everyone has the same thesis, which is, uh, this can't last. It's, you know, so the idea is like, you know, they're so uncertain about oil prices, they don't want to own these energy stocks. And so in addition, we've not had much of a new supply cycle over the past, say, five years. So ever since oil fell off a cliff in 2014, there's been a sharp reduction in CapEx. Um, you know, OPEC is kind of, uh, you know, arguably out, out of spare capacity. Um, and so I think that there's the supply side, in my view, somewhat more important than the demand side. And then especially when we get to a point where the United States is no longer drawing down its strategic petroleum reserve, right? So that's, that's essentially a new, uh, you know, a new form of demand if that just stops going down. Um, uh, and if China ever decides to come out of these rolling lockdowns, uh, you know, they, they've, th- there's good data showing how significantly they've been holding down uh, uh, flights, uh, and then probably also automobile uh, usage, right? So different types of fuels in China are well below their their baseline already. Um, in addition, this is this is where oil prices are with the dollar going straight up, right? And so mm-hmm. imagine if that just even not even not just falls, imagine that just stops going up at the same pace it has been. It just kind of levels out for a period of time, especially in a number of currencies. You know, if they if they pause, let alone pivot, if they just pause or they have to reliquify something, right? And if you get some sort of local top in the dollar, who knows what could happen to the dollar price of, of energy. Uh, and so I do think that there are reasonable concerns 
over the next six to 12 months about the sector. Uh, I think it's going to be a volatile ride. I would not be levered long, you know, small cap energy producers, right? Because I think you're going to have a bad time uh, if you do. Uh, but I, so I'm structurally long with a multi year view and uncertain enough about that tight, you know, tight supply demand dynamics. There's multiple headlines I could wake up to that would make me either a little bit more bullish or a little bit more bearish on oil over a three to six month period. Um, but it's something that I'm, I'm willing to unlevered hold through this period of volatility because I think the underlying situation is very, very different than, say, the 2000s decade. So there's, there's been no supply cycle yet, uh, and there's only so much demand that can come off the market, and there's all these temporary su- forces that are already kind of you know artificially suppressing it as it is. Yes, I would agree. Just looking at, let's say, a company, an oil, oil company's production, the production is not that much up over the past two years, whereas you're saying normally it's very responsive when if, if oil goes from negative 20 to 120, you'd think that oil companies would make more oil or produce more oil, but but they're, they're really not. Tell me, though, about you said that oil companies are cheaper now than they were before, before uh, 2008. You know, I, I just know historically, like the price to earnings ratio of ExxonMobil was like six to eight, maybe like but before the 2008 financial crisis. And, you know, the oil prices companies, they have gone up a lot. So, you know, are you, are you, and also it's so tough because the forward earnings are entirely based on the price of oil, which, you know, by the definition is unknowable. So like uh, what metrics are you using and how are you thinking about that when, when you when you uh, come to the conclusion that that oil companies, despite the huge rise, are still cheaper than than, you know, back in the day? So I look at things like price to cash flow over a multi-year period. Uh, I also look at things like pre- like dividend yields for these large caps because you know earnings change a lot more rapidly than their dividend do- does, right? And so generally in this environment, you know, last time you had that huge uptick in oil and you had a huge uptick in these energy companies. And right now, for example, they've been, you know, most oil companies are like their stock price is like f- down or sideways, you know, over like a 15-year period. Right, this is not some sort of bubble mm-hmm. in in energy equities, right? So even though they're they're raking in profits, um, they don't have exposure to much globalization, right? So they don't have to worry about like Chinese supply chain issues. Um, you know, they have they have basically good dividends, good cash flows. Uh, many of them have stronger balance sheets, um, and so I, I generally find that a lot of them are they've not kind of reflected the idea that that oil probably has like a, a you know a floor. In the in the say seventy it doesn't mean it can't briefly go below that, but there's a pretty strong bid by either OPEC or or the SPR once once you go below seventy, uh, while the upside is who knows what the upside could be. I mean, oil prices could do what natural gas prices in Europe did, and and it, it's it's unclear. Um, and I'm talking about like say a five year period, right? And so I think that the upside of of energy prices is much bigger than the downside of of oil prices. Uh, and that they're they're kind of pricing in something along of this like lower end of that range as though that's going to stay there forever or you know even go down. And so for example, I look at I look at Morningstar analysis of like energy companies, for example, and they'll generally assume like a return to the prior five year baseline of oil companies, which if, I guess that's mm-hmm. fine, that's conservative, right? So you're 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 valuing the company based on that, and that that's a, that's a good thing to do. But then it's like okay, what if what if that doesn't happen? What if you don't go back to 60, 70 oil? What if what if the new normal is $100 oil? Or what if the new new normal becomes $120 oil, which again is still below the peak price you reached b- before the global financial crisis, let alone the fact that the inflation adjusted price. So it's not even extreme energy pricing at that point. Uh, and so I, I still think they're, they're cheap relative to the range of outcomes, considering that we've not had any sort of supply response yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, that makes sense. Lynn, I want to return to the dollar, the sort of bear case um, for the dollar a year ago was central banks are you know, selling treasuries. They're not, when they have foreign reserves, they're not accumulating dollar denominated treasuries. They're accumulating uh, other FX reserves and they're accumulating gold, uh, other stuff like that. And that continues to be true. And it's, if anything, only accelerated uh, uh, be- because of uh, the, the war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but during that time, the fundamental the, the fundamentals for why the dollar should go down happened, and yet the dollar did not go down. It actually exploded higher. 
And, you know, I, I think that's because the Federal Reserve was, was so quick to raise rates. So it's sort of a sucking, sucking capital all, all, all around the globe. But uh, how have your views on the dollar uh, changed over the past year? And you know, what's, what's your outlook? So once we started to get that energy crisis in Europe, which actually came before the war, that, that came in the second half of 2021. Once that started to materialize, um, I became a lot more neutral and not strongly opinionated on the dollar index itself because it's so euro heavy and it's so it, it's weighted towards all these developed market currencies. And I became a lot more selective with which, which country specifically I'm talking about when I talk about a strong or a weak dollar. Um, and so, you know, again, going back to the prior point, for example, Brazil, the currency is held up very well compared to the dollar. So a lot of what we've seen, it's almost like a barbell. There's, there's been severe weakness in developed market currencies. Most of them are energy importers, and they have so much debt that they can't raise rates enough. On the other end of the spectrum, you, you have a lot of frontier markets obviously running into currency problems, as they always do uh, when the dollar gets strong. Whereas if anything, there's been like a strong middle, right? So some of the, some of the major emerging markets, uh, you know, they, they've – their currencies are either up or flat against the dollar in some cases, or they're down, but they're not as down as like even the major developed currencies, right? And so I think a lot of it is on a currency by currency basis. If you're a highly indebted country and you have a energy input problem, that's like the worst case scenario for your currency um, because you can't raise rates enough to get the positive real rates. Uh, and you, you know, that, that's basically an emerging market crisis for a developed market currency. Right, because you can't print energy in a similar way that emerging markets can't print dollars for their dollar dominated debt. You know, these these Western countries cannot print energy if they have trouble getting it. And so, you know, I've been uh, very cautious over the past year about these um, kind of just financialized Western sovereigns, and I've been more constructive on countries like Brazil, uh, you know, to a lesser extent Mexico, um, uh, India countries that are either lower debt or that they have more commodity exposure, uh, you know, even Canada to some degree, uh, you know, they have debt problems, uh, but at least they have energy, for example. And so I, I, I think we have to be more selective with how we look at this. Um, and then it's also, I mean, obviously there's been a huge rate. So when you go back to those, those top currencies, there's been a huge rate differential. So the feds hiked rates super aggressively. Powell thinks he's Volcker. Uh, while, while, while Kuroda is playing the 1940s playbook where he's like, we're not even going to try. We're, we're, we're just going to hold rates super low. And so that's causing a huge differential. And it's funny. If you see the comments out of a lot of the Jap Japanese ministers, they're kind of like, well, we're kind of fine with a lower currency. It, you know, it, it's good in some ways. It's bad in other ways. Uh, you know, they want to make sure it doesn't get too disorderly. Um, but that, that's kind of the environment that we're in now. And as long as that dollar is screaming higher, it's unlikely to be good for most foreign assets. It's, it's unlikely to be good for most domestic assets. Uh, because you know the, the foreign sector is still selling treasuries, uh, and still even in many you know the Swiss Swiss for example they're not buying stocks like they used to be buying stocks for example, and so that that puts ongoing pressure, and so I think that continues until the dollar kind of stops its like vertical ascent, uh, but I think it's from an investor perspective it's good to look on a currency by currency basis and look at look at their dollar dominated debt look at their reserves relative to GDP. Look at their energy situation. Are they net exporter? Are they net importer? Are they balanced? You know, so that they don't really have a crisis from it. And I think those are the main variables to look at. And those variables are both very poorly for the Japanese yen, where, as you mentioned, the Bank of Japan is suppressing the entire yield curve, not just like the overnight rate. And also, they're a huge importer of energy. So you said the Japanese uh, ministers are saying, "Oh, it's fine. We have you know weak yen. That's that's good for our exporters." But what happens? You know, I'm in New York City and uh, there's sort of a, you know, you, you often see a lot of, uh, tourists who come here from Japan. What happens when people come from Japan and, uh, the, the yen is not as strong as it used to be. And if they want to buy a hot dog, they have to pay a lot of yen for it. Uh, do you, do you, is there ever, uh, you know, is there at some point where the bank of Japan says, whoa, this is, this is too weak. You know, the yen is way too weak. We need to strengthen the yen. So it's, it's possible. Uh, the problem is once you, once you give up on yield curve control, it's hard to get the market to, you know, ex uh, believe your next target, right? So in the beginning, the market was heavily testing their yield curve peg and they defended it aggressively. And so the market has settled down trying to attack that peg and instead they're just selling the currency. Uh, and so if they ever move that, um, 
it's hard to then defend the second one. It's possible that they will. I, like I said before, I think they with with zero point two five percent, I think they pick too low of a number. I think because they have two hundred fifty percent debt to GDP, they don't really have a choice um, to to peg it somewhere. But I think that 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 low of a level was was probably unnecessary. Um, but the one lever that they still have to pull, and they've already dabbled in a little bit, is selling some of their reserves and doing interventions. Uh, and so one difference between Japan and Europe, I say two differences. One, Japan's energy situation is bad, but it's actually not as bad as Europe. Uh, their their prices did not blow out to the same degree. And then also, I think they're more pragmatic. They're like, okay, we got to get these nuclear th- uh, reactors back on quicker. Uh, let's ramp this up. You know, they're not, they don't really have you know, uh, kind of the ESG politics to the same degree uh, that we see over in Europe. They're kind of less ideological about how they want their energy to mix to look. Unlike Europe, they weren't relying on Russian uh, pipelines. And so obviously they're, the the fact that LNG markets were expensive is not great for them, but it's overall less of an energy shock than Europe, number one. And number two is they have more reserves, both in absolute terms and relative to GDP, than say a country like UK. Right, so UK has minimal reserves relative to the size of their economy. Japan has over a trillion dollars of treasuries, of you know, over a trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves, and so they have quite a bit of firepower to defend their currency. And one way to phrase it is, you you could almost you know, we show the charts of what the treasury market looks like in terms of volatility and um, uh, you know, illiquidity. Imagine if if Kuroda like really sells some treasuries, right? So he's you know. The question is, who can stay solvent? Like, can China and Japan sell treasuries longer than the Fed can stay tight, given the state of the treasury market, right? And so there could be a period where, you know, they sell enough treasuries, or they don't. This, all these places stop buying treasuries. The Fed has to reliquify, and you get some sort of like slowdown, at least in in the ascent of the dollar index compared to some of these currencies. And I think we're not quite there yet, but it's something I've been to watch out for because when I see people talking about the dollar screaming higher, I don't see enough people talking about that that feedback loop of like, okay, if it gets mm-hmm. as bad as as some of the, you know, kind of the the most hawkish predictions suggest it will, uh, you have to imagine what happens to those treasury holdings of some of those major powers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lynn, the, the final topic I, I want to revisit is the long-term debt cycle, which when we did this interview a year ago, I thought I understood, but I, I feel like I've learned a lot more about it and thought more about it uh, since we did that that first interview on Forward Guidance. Uh, after I ask this question, I'll, I'll put up a, a few charts, but can you explain the framework of debt cycles and how private debt moves to federal debt, moves to private debt, and then where we are in the cycle and, and how that matters? So the long-term debt cycle was, in that phrasing, was proposed by Ray Dalio. Years ago, what I did was I, I kind of took his observation and I reconstructed all the numbers myself. Um, and I went through kind of all these data sets and looked at it from multiple angles. And um, I, I analyzed the problem. And essentially what you, there's kind of, everybody knows like the short-term credit cycle. So the three to 10 year normal business cycle during an expansion, you generally have more debt to GDP. Uh, say more corporate debt, more household debt. Then you have some sort of shock, contraction, central bank tightening, whatever it is that, that they kind of pop some of that bubble. And then you get a deleveraging event. But then it causes a recession. And so normally then you get policymakers come in, you know, central banks cut rates, fiscal policy generally gives some sort of stimulus. And that kind of short circuit the, the deleveraging cycle. And so you don't deleverage all of that debt to GDP you build up during that prior cycle. You might, you might deleverage half of it or a third of it. And they start building up from there. And so instead of looking like a sine wave of debt to GDP, it's like an upward sine wave. You get higher and higher debt relative to GDP, uh, higher highs and higher lows, and you get lower and lower interest rates. Uh, so you get h- lower highs and, and, and lower lows. And, so you, and that's what enables more and more debt accumulation. And that works until you run into roughly the zero bound. Uh, where you know you get zero interest rates, even in some cases now it's, it's been a new story of these mildly negative interest rates that we've seen. And then there's really nothing. The, the question is how you know if debt is super high and interest rates run into to zero, what do you do during the next crisis? Uh, and so that's where you get to what's the, the long-term debt cycle, which is usually you have a gigantic banking crisis and private deleveraging. Uh, and so we saw that in the United States in 1929, going into the 30s. And then we saw that in 2008 going into the 2010s. 
And so those those periods match up very similarly in terms of rates running into zero and and private debt to GDP reaching record levels. Uh, and then what happens generally is you start to get a rotation where more instead of relying on monetary policy because that's you know the tools are pretty much used up at that point, and you start relying on fiscal policy. You start doing more handouts. You start doing more you know stimulus checks. You start doing more um, uh, just war t- wartime spending type of dynamics, right? So the, the 2010s are really about that that kind of gradual grinding, deleveraging, and then putting debt uh, you know, from the private sector onto the public sector. And that's generally a pretty disinflationary type of environment because you have that private debt deleveraging, uh, you know, people don't have a lot of extra money. It's, it's just kind of a slower growth or a negative growth environment depending on how bad it is. And then the question is, what happens after like a decade, right? So that whole period, the problem there, both in say the 1930s and the 2010s, is you have a the pie is no longer growing in the way that it was. You know, there's not this cheap credit everywhere uh, in in the same way. There's not higher and higher debt to GDP, and so there's there's more rising populism. Uh, there's more kind of discontent with how the system's structured, with the prior institutions, uh, more polarization, political polarization. Uh, both domestically and then unfortunately between countries as well. So in, in, basically the rising populism in the 1930s is in large part what led to the conflicts of the 1940s. And so we've had rising populism throughout the 2010s, sometimes between countries, but a lot of it is just in, inside of countries. And then as we've entered the 2020s, you know, we entered the next shock, which was the you know pandemic, and then you lock down everything, and then you have such a highly levered system still that it, it can't lock down, so you have to just throw, you have to just print a gazillion dollars. The problem, uh, and you have wartime finance. Uh, it looks like a war, at least it wasn't a war yet, but it looked if the financial situation looked like a war. And then you also run into a situation where, due to that deleveraging, you didn't have a lot of uh, commodity supply growth because you've had low commodity prices, low demand. And then the problem is you exhaust that, you know, surplus. Uh, so you know we, you've drawn down some of the reserves, your, your demand is upticking over time, mostly from emerging markets. And so as that kind of populist deleveraging situation run into crises and run into, into commodity shortages, that's where you get phase two. That's where you get the 1940s. That's where you get the wartime finance. So I've been making the comparison, the 2020s are like the 1940s in the sense that, you know, we've gotten past some of the private deleveraging and now it's about the sovereign debt bubble. Now it's about all the debts already in the sovereign level, and they're running into high inflation, and they can't support super high interest rates, at least structurally for the long term. And so that's when you get in an environment of things like financial repression, like what Japan's doing. Uh, that's when you get in an environment of yields well below the inflation rate. That's when you get a period of, of rapid money supply growth from large monetized fiscal deficits. We saw that you know 2020 and 2021. We've, we've obviously taken a pause here in 2022. Um, but I, th- I think we'll, we'll see a resumption of that uh, in, in the subsequent years. Uh, and when they're mm-hmm. kind of, you know, past this kind of like record period of, of, of tightening. And so I, I, that's kind of an environment that's, it's a sovereign bond bubble more than anything else. You know, it's a sovereign bond bubble. And then by extension, it's a currency bubble. Uh, currencies are the release valve in many cases for these highly indebted sovereign countries, especially ones that are short energy. Mm. So we have a recession, it's just a short term, a cycle. We have a recession, which typically you would not expect the money supply to grow the, or actually decrease uh, during that period. But you're looking at the longer term uh, tailwinds of uh, basically money printing. So my, my question, Lynn, is what is the catalyst? In the 1940s, it was World War II. In the, you know, 1914 to 1918, it was uh, World War I. And then for Germany in the early 1920s, it was to, to pay off reparations. Uh, but those tend to be quite extreme events. And you know, we do have uh, a, a very severe issues um, with the war and J- Japan is defending its currencies. Um, but you know, do you think that the, the pressure, the exogenous pressure from the real economy is so extreme that we will see sort of the money printing and the financial repression that, that we saw in you know, 1914 to 1918 or, or the 1940s? Well, so I think we, we, there's a good chance we've seen the peak rate of change. Right. So, uh, you know, even then, I mean, even the even the rate we saw was not quite as big as the 40s. Um, uh, but I think it's 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 still a structural issue. So if you look at the United States, for example, 
you know, we have trillion dollar deficits uh, as far as the eye can see. And that's that's just baked in the cake from demographics and entitlement structures, right? So, so you know, you 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 have the the Fed try to tighten on one hand, but fiscal is still loose. You have the, at any point they can pull another level or level and uh, you know do student loan forgiveness again, for example, right? Um, they they can pass more bills like that, depending on how gridlocked they get. But even even short of any of that, they have five percent, uh, you know, of GDP. Deficits, trillion dollar deficits, and that's assuming that tax receipts don't fall off a cliff. If you have a recession, if you have a decline in asset prices due to so much tightening, you're likely to get a lagged response where tax uh, uh, income starts to stagnate, mm-hmm. and then you actually get a wider deficit, not because you're spending more, but because just that gap between automatic spending and receipts is, is widening to some extent. You're getting less GDP growth, um, and so that's. That's just more money still coming into the economy. And then a lot of that is inflation adjusting, right? So Social Security is inflation adjusting. Uh, healthcare is is dependent on healthcare inflation, right? Because they don't owe you a certain amount of, of dollars of healthcare. They owe you a certain amount of healthcare, right? And so I think that's the problem in developed markets around the world, which is there's not a clear way out of the of the trap that they're in. And so in a, in a benign environment, I think it's like a slow grind where you just have – kind of persistent inflation above yields. And so bondholders and, and and cash holders are just getting devalued on a gradual grinding basis. And then you can punctuate that with more explosive events if you have like an acute energy crisis, if you have an acute war mm-hmm. and things like that. So people often say that demographics are disinflationary. As a population ages, that should be disinflationary. That's that's the argument because old, older people consume less. And so when you look at Japan over the past couple decades they've been disinflationary because it's a very aged society uh there's not a lot of growth there but the problem is one that happened during a period where you you had china coming online china was supplying you you know they could outsource you know if they don't have enough young workers they can buy stuff from china they can buy stuff from vietnam they can buy stuff from you know uh, india right They, they there's there's all these other demographics that they can draw from to support their aged society. They also did that in a period uh, for the 2010s of uh, uh, commodity bear markets, right? So less inflationary pressures from from that end. Now the problem is, what if everybody gets to that point, or what if what if the major powers all get to that point? What if what if China uh, starts hitting peak demographics, which they arguably have, right? So you no longer have those rising young populations to support the older countries. And so you have a situation where, you know, Europe, China uh, kind of run into the situation that Japan did. And then there's no rising power big enough to offset that in the way that China offset, you know, Japan aging, for example. And so the way I phrase it is that one country aging alone is kind of disinflationary, but all the major powers aging together is actually quite inflationary, arguably, because you have a labor shortage. There, there's only, you know, so much, the, the number of people, it used to be when Social Security was developed, there was like, you know, dozens of workers for every one retiree, and now there's only a handful mm-hmm. of workers for every retiree, and that's that's basically stagflation in one of two weeks. Either you have to increase taxes a lot and support that, uh, which is slower growth, or you know, rising taxes becomes untenable and cutting it becomes untenable and you print the difference. And there's just not enough goods and services to go around, but there's still all these promises to those people. And so I, I, I think in general, you know, in a, on a good day, we're in kind of a, uh, a long grind towards higher inflation, less globalization, more energy shortages and st- structural deficits that are, you know, kind of eventually kind of monetized, you know, maybe not for periods of time, but structurally they are. And then, you can punctuate that with these, you know, kind of more idiosyncratic reasons. Uh, Lynn, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, on Forward Guidance. Uh, we'd love to have you on in on October 20th, 2023, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, sometime before then. Thanks so much. Happy to. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for watching. A few housekeeping items before I let you go. Subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube channel so you don't miss another episode of Forward Guidance. Uh, You can find Forward Guidance, the podcast you just listened to, on your favorite podcast app. That's Apple Podcast, Spotify, Overcast, Podbean. Uh, That's Podbean as in 
on this pod, I've been saying that the Fed pivot is still far away. In addition, please check out today's sponsor. It really helps the show. Link is in the description. Finally, BlockWorks is looking for a video editor. Go to blockworks.co slash careers to learn more. Thanks for watching.